Thanks for joining us, Sean. When you come back to Syracuse, you take time to speak with students about your broadcasting experiences, and your dad was a pretty famous journalist in the Boston area. What's the most important thing he taught you about sports journalism? I think the biggest lesson I learned from my dad is the importance of telling the truth. And uh, when my dad passed away, he was a sports writer for, for the Boston Globe for 42 years, and I think it was indicative of the respect that he had earned, not just in the Boston area where he worked and lived for his entire life, but around the country. Uh, they had to have his wake, we had to have his wake in the Boston Garden because that's how many people wanted to come. And I think it was because he was such a man of integrity and uh, he did a lot to help other people. And those are the lessons that I learned. Treat other people well and work hard at your job and tell the truth. So how difficult is it to remain neutral when calling Syracuse games? Uh, obviously, you're, you're a fan of the team. You went here for four years. You graduated from Syracuse. Yeah, and we do a lot of Big East games, as you know, Greg. So the other coaches, most of them know I went to Syracuse. So every now and then, you'll be at one of their practices when they're getting ready to play Syracuse, and one of them might say, didn't you go to Syracuse? But uh, once the game starts, I think the fan goes out of you. I'm more excited about watching Syracuse games as a fan on TV when I'm not working. When you're doing the game, you really have to be focused on the important parts of doing your job and paying attention to what's going on in the game rather than being a fan and wondering why these refs keep making bad calls that aren't going our way. <laughs> so you called the six overtime game between Syracuse and UConn. What it's was still going on. <laughs> <laughs> it's actually, I finally gave up. I decided to leave, but I think they're still playing. Good for you. So what was the best part about that night? There were a lot of great parts of it. I think there were memories that I have that will last forever. Uh, one of them is just the amazing number of phone calls, text messages, and emails that I received at 1.26 in the morning when the game ended, because that's how much it captivated people, that so many people who weren't even Syracuse people might have stayed up to the end because the game just drew them in and wouldn't let them go. Bob Costas was out in Hawaii with his wife, and they were supposed to go to dinner at a nice restaurant, and he kept telling his wife, uh, call and see if we can push it back 15 minutes so I want to watch the other game. Honey, call again. See if you can push it back 15 <laughs> minutes. And uh, they never went to dinner that night. So uh, and I think the thing that was most amazing to me about the actual game was for the first five overtimes, Syracuse was never ahead once, not even by one point for one second. So to constantly be behind or even and playing with that kind of pressure and to be able to force the game into a six overtime was remarkable. Who's your favorite Syracuse athlete of all time and why? Wow, that's a great question. And it's hard for me to believe that uh, no one's ever asked me that before. I'd have to think about that. Uh, probably Ernie Davis, you know, just because of everything that he represented. Obviously, I didn't know him, but I've heard a lot about him. I thought they did a nice job in the movie that they made, part of it up here on campus, of capturing what he was like as a person. And anybody who knew him said he represented everything that you would want, you know, representative of your university to stand for. So, uh, but there's been so many athletes here and coaches here uh, that I've admired over the years. It would be hard to pick just one. You know, the person who had the greatest influence on me while I was here in athletics was Coach McPherson. Dick McPherson was our football coach back then, and I worked for him as a work-study student, and he's another person who treated me uh, exceedingly well. And, you know, he was a big man on campus, but he treated everybody the same, and that was exceedingly well. So uh, he was a great influence on me, too, and a wonderful guy, and still a very dear friend. So last question, we'll end on a lighter note. Uh, what's your most embarrassing on-air moment? Oh, gosh. I'm kind of embarrassed every Monday night just to have to work with Jay Billis and Bill <laughs> Raftery, so that's kind of a weekly occurrence. I have had uh, a few of them uh, accidentally cursed on the air one time, I was doing a Boston Red Sox game on ESPN, and Dwight Evans came up to the plate, and he was, uh, he had 2,299 career hits. So I wanted to say he was one hit shy of 2,300, and unfortunately I got to the, the S in front of hit and uh, <laughs> said he was that shy of 2,300. Uh, how'd that, I had another how'd time, that go over? Uh, well, Ray Knight was the color commentator, he immediately took his headset off and put his head down on the desk and started laughing. <laughs> so I said, uh, I did say he is one hit shy of 2300, didn't I? And they were like, oh yes, that's absolutely what you said. I was on Nesson one time too, and I had cut myself shaving uh, that morning, and it was pretty bad, we had a hard time stopping it, but it, it stopped. And then uh, right before we went on the air, I must have brushed my chin or something, and uh, 
it was starting to come on the air. I was hosting the Red Sox pregame show. They're counting in my ear, five, four, three. And I look down, I see what I thought was maybe ketchup on the set. I said, was somebody having lunch on the set? There's, and there was somebody bleeding in the stage. And I said, oh my gosh, it's you who's bleeding. One, go. So I look in the camera, I start talking, and I look in the monitor out of the corner of my eye, and it wasn't just a little dot of blood. It went all the way down uh, my neck onto my white shirt collar. It looked like <laughs> someone had attacked me right before we went on the air. So uh, that was kind of embarrassing, too. That tape still exists somewhere, unfortunately, even though it was has 20 years Has it made its way to YouTube? It probably has. Everything makes its way to YouTube eventually, which mm -hmm. I'm not sure is a good thing, but it happens. Sure. All right. Thanks, Sean, for joining us. We appreciate it. My pleasure. This has been Five Questions with Connects. And five really long answers. <laughs> <laughs>